And now I'm very happy to introduce Nikolai Punin from New York. And uh, um, well, I have to say that not much is known about him. He of Bregan City at the conference that was called um, uh, the conference that was called the most important thing is to start well and he gave his first lecture about Malevich in the West then he um, this uh, um, lecture was given in Montreal in Fox Center and now we're going to have this lecture here in Moscow okay now let's um, uh, welcome Nikolai Punin from New York so the title of the lecture is uh, Nikolai Punin, Malevich in the West. So we will begin our story this evening with this picture of a small town in Bregenz, which is on a lake between Switzerland and Austria. And what we see on the left is the city hall, and the right, on the right is uh, Kunsthalle with a big sign, Free IWW, in support of a Chinese artist who was at the time imprisoned in his home country. It looks a bit strange to have in Austrian town a scene like this. Uh, I was invited to this place to give a talk at the event exhibition or conference organized by a group of artists and art historian enthusiasts, mostly from Berlin. The, it was titled Anfang gut, alles gut, meaning what's begins well, ends well. That was inspired by the 1913 opera, the first futurist opera titled Victory Over the Sun, Pobeda nad Solcem by composer Matyushin, poet Khrushchenik and painter Malevich. Interestingly, as we could see on the poster, one of the participants was my old friend Kazimir Malevich. He was exhibiting on one of his black squares, one of his black, yeah, and series of drawings related to the opera. So these are the costumes and the stage designs. Um, and yeah, a year earlier in Eindhoven, another small town, this time in Holland, in the Van Abe Museum, we can see people gathered in front of Malevich's paintings, including a teacher with the school children. And if we go to a bigger town across the ocean, to, to its museum of modern art, in, a, in any average day we can see numerous visitors in the, in the galleries filled with works by Malevich. And if and the visitor of Moscow could see the Red Square, Bolshoi Theater, and Tretyakov Gallery, and would notice that the Russian museums are full with visitors. However, if they decide to go to the 20th century Tretiakov Gallery, they will see scenes like this. Surprisingly, there, is, there were no visitors in the museum at the galleries with the Russian Soviet avant-garde, and they were all empty. There was no one there in front of the black square. And in Petersburg, it is almost certain that no one in this outdoor cafe knew that in the building next to it, less than 100 years ago, one could see a site like this. At the last futurist exhibition organized by Malevich and his colleagues and friends. After so many years, I begin to wonder how at all someone like Malevich could appear in, in, in the Tsarist and predominantly feudalistic Russia 
when even today, 100 years later, it seems that there is no much public interest in his work in Russia. There are different ways to tell the story. This evening I will begin with, a, with a Sergei Shukin, a textile merchant from Moscow who, who in the early 90s, 1900s used to travel to Paris, which was at that time the center of modern world in addition to his, in, and in addition to his business, he became a passionate collector of modern art. And in Moscow built this house to exhibit his collection. In several years, he acquired an impressive collection that will include eight Cezannes. These are three of them. 39 Matisses exhibited in this room. And he even invited Matisse to do these two large paintings that are not today at the Hermitage. He also acquired 51 paintings of young Picasso, some of which were taken directly from his studio. So many Parisians even didn't have a chance to see these paintings before they came to Moscow. So this is a room with uh, Picasso paintings. Uh, he also, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, some of which were taken from the studio. They were not seen in Paris, but they could be seen in Moscow. Some of the Picasso paintings, like this one, which was brought to the Moscow night to Moscow 1908 by another collector, Morozov, now is is in the Pushkin Museum, were acquired from Gertrude Stein. We see Gertrude Stein, a, an American uh, writer, and also a collector of modern art. She became a very good friend of Picasso sitting beneath her portrait made by Picasso and some Cubis paintings. At this place at 27 Rue de Fleurus, a visitor had a chance to see, see for the first time paintings by Cezanne, Matisse and Picasso hanging together. It was around 1905. So this was a place where for the first time Paintings by Matisse, Picasso, and Cezanne were hanged together in one room. And among those Picassos were included these two important Picasso paintings uh, that are today exhibited at Hermitage. So Shukin acquired these paintings from Gertrude Stein. The impact of, the, of this uh, collection on American reception and interpretation of European modern art articulated in the mid-1930s through the MoMA narrative is discussed in the recent article by Walter Benjamin, The Making of, of Americans. It was published in the Eflux magazine. Uh, however, it seems that this Paris collection might have also influenced Chukin to focus on collecting Cezanne, Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso, thus shaping in Russia the image of modern art that was at that time emerging in Paris. So the thesis here in the Benjamin's article is that it is American collectors who were coll collecting European art in very particular way, naming, namely collecting its avant-garde created image of, Ameri of European art in America that was uh, different for, from what was in Europe. We can think today <clears throat> that maybe the same collection, the Stein's collection, influenced Chukin to collect Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso, and thus shaping the image of modern art in Russia as well through these three artists. It was not only the Russian collectors who were looking toward Paris, but also the artists like Natalia Goncharova and Mikhail Larionov, who both took part in the international exhibition of paintings Salon of Golden Fleece in Moscow, 1908. And you can read here some of the names of the 
uh, artists, including besides Goncharov and Larionov. It was the, what was at that time, really the avant-garde in Paris. It included Bonnard, Cezanne, Deren, Matisse, Braque. Interestingly, there is no Picasso here yet. So these are some of the pages of the catalog. And you can see the list of the artists. So the exhibition took place five years before the famous 1913 Armory Show in New York. And, and as my colleague Alfred Barr have stated many years later, at the time, this was the most, the best selection of post-impressionist painting shown anywhere, including France. So Moscovites had a chance to see the most advanced art from France before even French had the chance to see it. Four years later, 1912, still before the Armory Show, another important international exhibition took place in Moscow. It was the, the French exhibition of painting and, uh, paintings, contemporary art. This time it, it included Picasso and Lager, but also artists like Heckel and Kirchner, thus it was not entirely French. We recognize Matisse, Marquet, Metzinger. Parallel with the international exhibition, important books are being translated, like this 1913 on Cubism by Alfred, Al Albert Glaze and Jean Mensiger, only a year after it was published in France. Or the new painting by Ludwig Kellen, where we see several movements being brought into the kind of a art on the scene. Like it's not only artists like Van Gogh and Cezanne, but, uh, Gauguin, but also Cubism, Expressionism, Futurism. Also, Marinetti's uh, book uh, uh, titled Futurism, 1914. And parallel with that, begin appear the studies that were produced in Russia, like this uh, by Alexander Shevchenko on Cubism and other uh, contemporary movements in painting. And Malevich on from Cubism to Suprematism, and later uh, from Cezanne to Suprematism. Out of all this, an art scene began to emerge in Russia, one that was oriented toward these most advanced developments in Paris, a group of Jack of Diamonds that included Malevich, organized its first exhibition in 1910-1911, and these are some of the participants. Uh, Malevich was one of the works Malevich exhibited was this one, The Baders. On this installation that was recently apparently found, uh, it's from 1913 exhibition in Kursk. We could see, we can recognize several Malevich paintings, including, they, they're here, including, for example, this one and this one. I will, I'll show these are. Uh, uh, Argentine, Arg Argentine polka, Argentina polka, and uh, uh, Reaping Woman. In 1914, together with Alexei Morgunov, uh, in February, he went to Kuznetsky Most in Moscow, and uh, they both held. Uh, a futurist, futurist demonstration, and according to the press, they were carrying spoons on their shoulder attached to their coats. And this is most likely the first photo of Malevich ever to be published. It's 1914. Malevich is on the right. This right here. And this is Morgunov. Now, in the, in. Uh, uh, the same year, so it's 1914, uh, Malevich appears for the first time at the in foreign exhibition. This is Salon 
in, of independence or independence salon in Paris. And uh, this is a press uh, coverage. Uh, we see Archipenko and uh, uh, what Malevich exhibited are these uh, three paintings and portrait of Johan Klune, which is we see here and it we recognize here on this photo of this installation. As I mentioned at the beginning, Malevich, uh, at the beginning, Malevich begins his collaboration with Matyushin and Krushenik on the first futurist opera, Victory of the Sun, which took place in December that year at the Luna Park Theater. The most important part of this collaboration was his work on the stage designs. He did several designs on which, out of which came the idea for the black square. It's funny to see this word here, which means lupo, stupid. Who knows who put it there, Malevich or somebody else. Nevertheless, out of this drawing apparently came this painting. We see here this painting being exhibited in this corner for the first time in 1915 at the last Futurist Exhibition 110. This building was at the Marso Pole 7 in Petrograd. It's this building, and this is the catalog of the exhibition. And we can recognize some participants like Altman, Boguslavskaya, Kliun, Popova, Puni. Vladimir Tatlin was represented with this construction. And it would be interesting to find out what was this collective painting apparently made by Malevich, Boguslavskaya, Puni, Kljun, and Meinkov. We see here Rosanova and Boguslavskaya and Malevich sitting within inside his installation. This is here eight red rectangles, a part of the painting of Malevich. and the installation view we are very familiar today with. The exhibition was, no, uh, exhibition was noticed by the press. We see the coverage with some works even illustrated and this picture of the Malevich installation. This is not the same photo that we've seen. There is no chair here and there are no uh, labels on, the, on this photo. So it's a different photo. And the angle is different. It's not the identical photo like one we just seen. After, on the occasion of this exhibition, Malevich published a book titled From Cubism, Futurism to Suprematism. And this is most likely that the black square was ever printed for the first time. And this is the first printing reproduction of the black square and uh, it was also reproduced in the catalog in the book together with this uh, black circle and the suprematist uh, painting. In one of the earliest books uh, abroad titled The New Art from Russia published 1920 in Germany in Potsdam and in Munich its author, it, its author Konstantin Normansky mentions all the familiar names uh, Malevich and as he writes his followers Rosanova, Kljun, Puni and Rochenko and in, in, the, in the footnote he writes about uh, painting white or white as the null punct der Kunst, zero point of art. The next year 1921 in the book uh, Gegenwart Kunst Rus uh, Russland, published in Vienna, it, uh, its author Fritz Karpfen also writes about Malevich suprematism. It's here. And we can see here, he was also mentioning white on white. Somehow white on white became kind of a, the most known uh, outside of Soviet Union as a kind of a border case or the most uh, advanced painting. The first major exhibition abroad of recent Russian Soviet art 
many of you know, took place in Berlin, 1922. The Erste Russische Kunstausstellung. And it was organized in Galerie Van Damen, Diemen. And uh, on this picture we see David Sternberg, Sternberg, Marianov, Nathan Altman, Naum Gabo, and the owner of the gallery, Friedrich Lutz, 1922. And this is installation view, Gabo Rochenko, uh, and I would say that this was perhaps the, for Berliner the most advanced exhibition ever seen before. I mean, never seen before. This is the catalog done by Lisitsky. And as we can see, Malevich was represented with five, five paintings. Three paintings were titled Suprematism. One was this, and one was white on white, as you can see here. And also this uh, earlier cubist painting, the knife grinder. What is important about this painting? It was acquired by the Societe Anonyme, a Museum of Modern Art in New York. And we see one of the installations and collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was established by Catherine de Rijer and Marcel Duchamp in 1920. It was perhaps the most advanced collection of modern and avant-garde art in the United States at that point. And uh, the Erste Russische Kunstausstellung in Berlin received uh, coverage. We see the press in Berlin. The exhibition went to Amsterdam, Stedelijk Museum. And uh, the same year, a review of the, uh, of the Berlin exhibition appeared in this issue in, of Zenit magazine with Lisitsky cover published in Zagreb which devoted the entire double issue to the Russian new art. You can see they're using both the Cyrillic and Latin alphabet. And included this contribution by Malevich, the title, The Laws of New Art. Uh, years later, in the artist's confessions by Paul Westheim, published in Berlin 1923, there is a chapter, Kazimir Malevich Considerations, and also reproduce this painting that we see at the Erste Russische Kunstausstellung. Malevich was engaged, I'm sorry for this photo, uh, in uh, Unovis, and we see him on train with a group of his colleagues and students traveling from Vitebsk to Moscow. Also interesting to notice that some of the people on the picture are carrying a black square here, and Lisitsky also here. Like some kind of a... Uh, badge uh, together with his colleagues Tatlin and Rochenko Malevich was engaged in establishing the Museum for Painterless Culture in Moscow 1919 in addition to its interesting name sounds almost like an anthropological museum this was one of the earliest museums of the 20th century contemporary art it appeared a year before already mentioned Societe Anonyme Museum of Modern Art in New York, and in both cases these were museums established by artists in Moscow and in New, and in New York. At the exhibition of paintings of, of Petrograd artists of all trends, 1918-1923, which took place in Petrograd. We see Malevich here in the front entrance and here on the left. Uh, in the catalog, we could see Unovis represented. And there is a list of works, but 
you should notice there is no individual name attached. Other parts have names. Other participants appear with their names. Unovis appears with no names. Only list of works. Here too, this is the other side. So these are the works by Unovis. And then you have the rest of the participants. And in the installation, you just see Unovis and uh, the movements, uh, cubism, suprema, futurism, suprematism. This is a close-up. So that's an interesting detail, that at that point, Unovis appeared as a collective with no individual identity. Um, Another, and this is a collective photo of the participants at that exhibition. Uh, we can recognize Malevich here in the center. Another major appearance of the new Russian Soviet art was 1924 at the most prestigious international exhibition, the Venice Biennale. This is the Russian pavilion. And this is the, uh, uh, it was the separate catalog uh, there are two versions. There is an integral with uh, the Soviet delegation was within a general catalog, and there is another version with a separate, and this is a separate publication. We see an ink of uh, portrait of Stalin, or oh, pardon, Trotsky. Not a big mistake. And uh, Yeah, uh, so it's, uh, and within the installation, this was the dominant figure. So it's 1924. And on the list of the artists in the catalog, we can see Malevich listed with three paintings. Uh, a black square, a black cross, and uh, uh, black, black circle. Although, according to the catalog, was represented with these paintings, on these installation views, we don't see any of these paintings by Malevich. This is the most avant-garde section of the representation. However, in this contemporary book about the Venice Biennale, author Vigo Nebbia is mentioning uh, Ljubov Popova, Kazimir Malevich, Rochenko, as a part and Alexander Exeter as well, as a participant. So we really don't know uh, if the works have been exhibited at the 24th Venice Biennale. When Hans Arp and El Lisitsky published a book titled Kunst Kunstisms, uh, covering the, defining the movements up that emerged in the art scene from 1914 and 1924. This is a cover designed by Lisitsky. Under the suprematism, it includes Malevich, Unovis, and Rozanova, and Kluhn. And uh, this might be the second photo of Malevich known to be published so far. This is 1925 issue of Europa Almanach, edited by Carl Einstein and Paul Westheim, published in which uh, uh, Malevich published the, uh, uh, which was published article titled Malevich and Suprematism, not by Malevich. While the same year, Across the Ocean, in the Societe Anonyme, publication by Louis Lozovic, titled Modern Russian Art, appeared this reproduction of the, from the Societe Anonyme collection. So uh, uh, this was uh, perhaps the first time that Malevich painting was being uh, reproduced and then also exhibited at the exhibition Modern Art that was within Sesquicentennial, Sesquicentennial, and organized in Philadelphia. 
and we see the cover of the catalog and that was the last uh, well, the first time that Malevich exhibited uh, a, that the work of Malevich was exhibited in the United States meanwhile by the time the signs start to emerge that the atmosphere in the Soviet Union is begin, beginning to change one of the earliest books trying to articulate new socialistic approach to art and culture was this 1924 published book 1925 by Fedorov Davidov titled Marxist History of Visual Arts and it's uh, subtitled Methodological and Historiographical Essays just reading the titles of the chapters place of Marxist history of visual arts among other histories what is sociological history of art as aesthetic background uh, then um, this was a scheme of a schema for this constructing materialistic history of visual fine arts a role of personality in the history of visual arts we see this as a very dialectic of visual fine arts this we see it's very ideologically defined and very theoretical book and as a consequence that we could notice that things starts to change on the ground the same year Malevich was dismissed as a director of the Ginkg hook uh, and exhibition at the Museum of Artist Culture in Petrograd was openly attacked uh, the so this is a uh, information about this he was in a, he was dismissed as a director of the Gink Hook and in February in spring the museum department is shut down and the collection is transferred to the State Russian Museum and they close they start uh, naming uh, this is the most uh, illustrative the cloister at the expense of the state that was how the Malevich installation was uh, categorized 1972 no, pardon, 1926. In 1927, Yoffe published uh, uh, a book uh, 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 with an attempt to articulate a new ideological approach. In the book, uh, Culture and Style, System and Principles of Sociology of Art, we have an attempt to define the culture of previous epochs in a new, objective and scientific way on materialistic basis and this title of the first chapter would indicate uh, uh, that the intentions it's called cultural economy then we have a sociology of art culture and style on natural economy culture and styles on commodity and monetary economy and in a chapter five culture and styles of industrial economy we could notice a subcategory art of industrial bourgeoisie in which we find uh, a constructivism here. Listen. It is in this chapter we will find Malevich first on page uh, 3308 and it's uh, the same a knife grinder that is in American collection. The question is if this uh, choosing this to illustrate the bourgeois art was uh, defined by or uh, determined by the fact that it was in the in the American collection. Uh, further on page uh, three, 312 we have analysis of this suprematist work and architectonics. Perhaps the key sentence in this ambition to be objective, scientific, with a scientific approach is at the end of this paragraph. Uh, it is the suprematism must, uh, most abstract tendency in the, the left art is abstract plan for abstract construction. Flat suprematism we could interpret as industrial ornament 
which relation to mechanical forms is the same as geometrical ornament toward the form of plants, forms of plants. The practical consequence was that Malevich's work was now was perceived in terms of ornament and formalistic and decorative. And what is also important, it was placed in the category named Art of Industrial Bourgeoisie. That was the context. It is almost it is most likely that noticing these changes in the atmosphere led Malevich to take a huge number of his works, around 70 or more, from all his faces outside of the country. First, it exhibited them in Warsaw, in the Hotel Polonia, where it seems he, has received, he was received with great admiration. This is a reception for Malevich in the hotel, and we see some of the paintings on the walls. Immediately after, with the help of architect Hugo Herring, Malevich comes to Berlin. We see him in Unter den Linden uh, with his friend and interpreter Tadeusz Speiper. Malevich didn't speak German. In Berlin, Malevich was honored with a solo exhibition at uh, Grosse Berliner Kunstausstellung, 1927. This is one work that was reproduced in the catalog. And these are installation views of this exhibition. In some ways, perhaps, this was the most important exhibition in the story of Kazimir Malevich. And we'll see why. From Berlin, so these are the works. From Berlin, he briefly goes to Bauhaus at Dessau, where he, his book, The Non-Objective World, designed by Moholy Naj, was published. These are some of the pages, mostly drawings. Pardon. So Malevich, uh, um, before closing the Berlin show, Malevich returns to Leningrad, leaving all his works in Germany, in the custody of Hugo Herring. And Herring seems to know the right place where to take them. This was the uh, Hanover Provincial Museum, or later called the Landes Museum. He must have known Alexander Dorner, the museum director, since he left all the Malevich works in Dorner's custody. Dorner was already well known among his colleagues and museum professionals because of his innovative and unorthodox museum uh, Practice, especially because introducing a new museum display, he named the Atmosphere Room. The most famous of which was this room called by the Abstract Cabinet, conceived and constructed by Malevich student Lisitsky. Many years later, my colleague Alfred Barr would recollect Lisitsky Room with these words. 30 years ago, the Gallery of Abstract Art at Hanover was probably the most famous single room of the 20th century art in the world. A couple of years later, an exhibition of contemporary art of Soviet Russia was organized in New York at a Grand Central Place in this building. It was 1929. It was sponsored by the Amtrog Corporation uh, who was the first Soviet trade representation in the U.S. established by Armand Hammer in 1924 in New York. So this was, in fact, official Soviet exhibition in New York, 1929. Forward was written by Christian Brinton, who was, a, as we have seen previously, wrote for the 1926 Societe Anonyme catalog. In his forward, let me see. Where is the forward? Okay, I don't have a reproduction of the forward. Um, in his forward, he writes that the actual composition of the exhibition was an undertaking by the so Society of Cultural Relations for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries of the USSR. The main text, titled "Pictorial Art in the USSR," was written by Novitsky. 
Malevich was not Malevich was not represented at this exhibition, although he is mentioned in the short paragraph, and we could notice uh, my name as as well. Yeah, it's that my name is here. Okay. The, however, the most of the eight pages of the text are devoted to the Association of Artists of Revolutionary Russia. That was the major uh, part of the text. Perhaps it's worth mentioning that among the participants were Tatlin. This is in Tretyakov's gallery that you can see today on the right. Altman and Lisitsky. Perhaps it is worth mentioning that a few months later, in November, in, at the same town, opened a museum called the Museum of Modern Art with a rented exhibition, uh, exhibition which is the loan, so it was not owned by museum, and in the rented space. So that was the same year when this Soviet exhibition took place in New York. In the same year, there is an exhibition at the Tiako Gallery, the last, perhaps, uh, exhibition individual by, of Kazimir Malevich. It uh, says the exhibition of works of Kazimir Malevich. It's only one painting reproduced, and it's believed to be antedated. That's later pr produced later, but dated is 1910, 1911. And the article written uh, for the catalog and that's the only information is uh, by uh, Fedorov Davidov. It text is art of uh, the art of Kazimir Malevich. But it's interesting to see the conclusion of this text by Fedorov Davidov. After the Tiako exhibition, after the Tiako exhibition was transferred to Kiev Art Gallery. However, the director of the gallery, Fedor Kupman, was arrested for exhibiting bourgeois work, works by Malevich, and it is not surprising after being described by Fedor Davido as a formal experiment of the bourgeois art culture, as we can see here in the in the in this uh, text by Fedor Davido. So that was the new qualification for Malevich. The same year, 1929, Fedorov uh, Davidov published a book with almost a, a suprematist design titled Russian Art of Industrial Capit Capitalism. It's, I guess, uh, suprematist design is okay because it's a design, it's not art. And naturally, on page 62, he writes about Malevich. Slogan, more image, images replaced, more it means, more images re removed, replaced, more it means, represented the logical conclusion, natural end of this painterly trend. By the tra and painterly is under quotation. But the triumph of the painterly style led to its decline. Logically, it's come full circle, having developed to the highest extent, painting, suic painting suicide manifested itself in the black square of Kazimir Malevich. And notice that the black square is not a name of the work, it's just a black square. So that is the end of the painting. It's a dead end of the painting. Or, uh, pardon, it's a, uh, there is another dead end. This is a self-suicide of painting. So, and this is uh, 212. In spite of all this, Malevich continues to exhibit. 
and we see Malevich works here listed in the, on this uh, exhibition, 1932, including a black square and a red square. And the exhibition is the artist of a, a Russian uh, Soviet uh, Federation of Socialistic Republic, uh, or vice versa, for the 50th anniversary of the revolution. However, the exhibition also moved to Moscow and it was organized the, in the beginning of the next year with a, with a speech by the Bubnov he gave in Leningrad and the paintings that are illustrated at the beginning of the catalog are this uh, portrait by Gerasimov of Lenin and a portrait of Stalin by Brodsky. And under M we find Malevich uh, here, which is a girl with a flag. And uh, that is an interesting title. Then two, three uh, uh, figures. This would be interesting to find out what was this painting. Uh, and uh, Osip Be Besk in that time writes a formalism in painting and this is perhaps the most, how say, heaviest attack on Malevich that one can find. Uh, I won't translate you because I think it's self, it's telling. But the key in term here is a formalism. From now on, formalism will be for many decades uh, uh, the key uh, uh, way to describe uh, abstract art and dismiss abstract art. Naturally, in this kind of book, there is, should be something on Malevich and the black square is defined as a dead end of painting in this. So in the Fedorov Davido, it's a suicide of the painting, and here it's the dead end of the painting. And the exhibition begin to be organized to support this new approach toward the, this, uh, what we know as an avant-garde art, for, that was now called the formalistic art. And we recognize uh, Tatlin painting on the left, uh, fisherman and uh, on the right uh, Malevich that was also in the catalog of his uh, exhibition in Tretiakov Gallery and today we can see both of the paintings uh, hanging in the Tretiakov Gallery the Tatlin and this Malevich Okay. The next year, uh, uh, the Russian State Museum in Leningrad, exhibition of art of the imperialist epoch. We can also see here some of works Mal uh, of Malevich exhibited almost in a mocking, uh, uh, mocking way, like this installation we see here. Uh, and then we have the exhibition of the, uh, uh, the Department of the Capitalism. This is a photo from 1933. And it's very interesting to see suprematist paintings of Malevich being in frame, including the black square. This was never before and after seen. This is the only on this exhibition. Now, Fedoro Davido, 1923, uh, 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 he publishes a book, Soviet uh, Art Museums. And um, in this book, Fedoro reproduces few examples of these kinds of, of displaying specifically art of the epochs that preceded socialism. That this was the dilemma. If socialism was the point at that point, the most advanced society, then naturally its culture and art has to be the superior to those of feudalism and capitalism. 
However, since the Soviet museums have inherited or nationalized various collections, like those of Chukin and Morozov, the question was how, to, how the Soviet museums would exhibit, let's say, bourgeois art, but, not, but indicating to the visitors not to admire it. A similar dilemma emerged in Louvre during the first years of the French Revolution. The question was how to exhibit paintings with depicting kings or religious characters and not promoting publicly royalty or Christianity. The answer at that, was, at that time was, uh, still works today in these museums. And it is, we don't exhibit Jesus, we exhibit Rubens. That was the formula. In other words, by changing the narrative the war for a painting from Christian story to the art history, the meaning of the painting would change. It seems that Soviet theoreticians like Fedorov Davidov were more looking for some were looking for some similar solution. Instead of art history approach or interpretation, they were attempting to introduce something that would look like a scientific sociological approach in interpreting works of art of the previous epochs. Uh, and uh, here we have a, 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 an exhibition, Marxist complex ex exposition, art of developed bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisie before the proletarian revolution, presented by Fedorov Davidov in Tretiakov, 1931-1932. These are, this all seems to be Kubis paintings, including Tatlin's fishermen. We can notice that the display technique with large explanatory panels, there is an attempt to show these paintings not as art, not as work of art that should be admired, but as a specimen of a distant, almost foreign culture from the past. In principle, I think there is nothing wrong with this sociological or we could say today anthropological approach in looking at art as a cultural phenomena. Looking at art from the outside, the only problem I have here is that it is applied to particular art phenomena that should be only observed and not re respected or admired. While on the other side there is this our art, the real socialist art on which we do not apply this method. The Museum of New Western Art and Exhibition Style of Industrial Bourgeoisie. Uh, this was, uh, at, as you can see, it was attributed to Jaworski. It is interesting that all these illustrations have uh, clear authors uh, as uh, curators, Jaworski and Davidov. And this is another by Davidov. And this is very telling, the most illustrative uh, display. Exhibition of bourgeois art at the Tretiakov Gallery installed by the Fedorov Davidov showing composition by Kandinsky. Black on Black by Rochenko and two Malevich suprematist paintings, including Black Square. We could notice that there is no usual labels next to the paintings, only large banners. On the top, it says, the dead end of bourgeois art, almost as an echo of Baskin's description of Black Square to, uh, of the Black Square. On the left, formalism, and on the, on the, on the lower right, self-denial, samotricanje, almost like a psychological diagnosis. This sociological approach most likely inspired some academicians to propose an exhibition titled Exhibition of Economic and Social Roots of Art. Unfortunately, this catalog has no list of works. It will be interesting to find out how this exhibition actually looked like and what was work selected for this exhibition. I have not seen any information about this. Uh, what, uh, what I am also want to say here is uh, perhaps it will be interesting today to organize something along these lines, an anthropologic or ethnographic exhibition of art. I'm sure that my esteemed colleague Walter Benjamin would like this idea. In fact, I also would like to see exhibition applied to contemporary art done in this ethnographic manner. However, in this catalog, 
which is a German version of the Russian Soviet catalog of the, about the Russian State Museum in Leningrad, published 1935, we could notice that the museum is organized in a conventional way, as if all these attempts by Fedorov Davidov didn't have any impact on the museum practice. It is structured chronologically, and the Soviet art section appears with all previous epochs as the newest chapter in the history line. In one of the rooms of the department of the pre-revolutionary 20th century, room 11, as we can see it here, we could notice almost uh, among the other exhibited works by Rozanova, Tatlin, Altman, these are here, and suprematism by Malevich. At this installation view, we could see a few familiar Malevich works from all these periods, including one, one of the black squares. Interestingly, there is no labels on the walls. Instead, it seems that the labels are attached to the frames of the paintings. And in the socialistic art department, we could notice that the self-portrait of Malevich is also included here. And it was exhibited in room two. But these are some of the views uh, of the, of the, from the catalog of the socialistic department, how it looked like 1930, this is 1933. And at the end of the book is a chapter devoted to the uh, first exhibition of the Leningrad artist, almost as if the newest development is uh, continuation, is as a newest development in the art history. It shows two installation views. As we see, this is a temporary show. And on the listing of the artist exhibiting, there is no Malevich. However, in this catalog of the exhibition, which begins with this uh, Brodsky portrait of Stalin and Brodsky portrait of Zhdanov, we could find Malevich here with four portraits. Uh, uh, portraits of a girl is, in fact, this portrait. The question is here that it's here dated 1934, and here is it's from the Iskustvo magazine, a review of the exhibition, it's 32. It's from this article. And we see at the end of the review of the exhibition that these formalists are uh, 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 listed, and we see Malevich, Kljun, Filonov, Tatlin as formal. This was like end of the end of this, uh, uh, the avant-garde. The male portrait in this uh, is this, uh, the male portrait at the exhibition. It is believed to be a portrait of me, but I do not remember posing for it. The female portrait is portrait of his wife, Natalia. Well, this is his best known self-portrait. So these were the paintings that were believed to be in this exhibition. They are all signed with this black square as if Malevich didn't want to give up with this, this, his iconic image until the end. However, we could not be certain that these are the paintings that are the works listed in the catalog of the 1935 Leningrad exhibition. Since in this catalog of 1988 Leningrad exhibition, we see the same works but with the different dimensions. These are much larger dimensions than mentioned in the in the Leningrad exhibition 1935. So this maybe should be examined, this discrepancy, who made the mistake. Whatever is the case, these are uh, these four paintings were the last among the last paintings that Malevich painted. And this exhibition was the last exhibition of Malevich as a living artist, 1935. Malevich 
got terminally ill uh, and he dies on May 15 while this exhibition is still on. Uh, 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 we recognize Zygmalevich's importance. City Council of the Leningrad, uh, Leningrad decided to cover the burial expenses. His body was placed in a suprematist coffin designed apparently by Suetin and after being on display at his home, it was taken to the artist's house for a public mourning. Then taken to the Moscow station and brought to Moscow by, by train and uh, after cremation, the urn, was, uh, urn with ashes was buried on the field near his dach at Nemchinkova on, on the site we was uh, placed a cube, with, a cube with a black square designed by Sweatin. That's the end of that story. Not long after his death, Malevich's works were forgotten in his native, in his native land and his ideas about art and painting disappeared from the public memory to be replaced by the ideas such as those of the Association of Artists of Revolutionary Russia. Materials through the kind, these kind of paintings and as we can see this 1939 uh, publication of the muse museums in the Soviet Union uh, published in English. This is how the, the the exhibition of the Russian State Museums looked, looked like. Meanwhile, the political landscape in Europe was radically changed with the emergence of National Socialism in Germany. Attitude toward modern art by the new political establishment, particularly Adolf Hitler, was entirely intolerant. And the position of people like Alexander Dorner and the future of abstract cabinet became uncertain. It is in this atmosphere that 1935, 1935, the same year when the Malevich died, to this museum in Hanover came from this small museum in New York, a young Alfred Barr, the first director of the Museum of Modern Art of, uh, of uh, of more, or, yeah, first Museum of Modern Art of something that called itself museum but didn't have a collection and operated the first few years as a Kunsthalle in a rented space of five rooms. That was Museum of Modern Art at that time. This is how Alfred Dahr remembers his visit to Hanover. A, a last visit I last visited Hanover a Museum in 1935, two years after the Nazi seized power. The first thing I asked to see after being welcomed by Dorner was the Gallery of Abstract Art, Lisitsky Room. Elsewhere in Germany, modern painting had disappeared from museum walls, so I, ha uh, I half expected to find a famous room dismantled. Yet it was still there and as accessible to public through to visit it may have been risky for German since there were spies even in the museums. Dr. Dorner showed me the abstract gallery proudly, but it was the last redoubt. Within a year or so it was closed, its works of art dispersed, destroyed or sold abroad. Its director, a voluntary cultural refugee to the United States, Germany loss was our gain. Alfred Barr was very familiar with the Russian Soviet avant-garde. And uh, when he had a chance to see, uh, he was very uh, happy to have a chance to see Malevich works left in Germany after his 1927 Berlin show. And this was one of the key events, another key events in Malevich's story about Malevich's story. After Barr, Alfred Barr, of course, knew about Malevich since at, at the end of 1927. He went to Moscow with his friend Jerry Abbott, who is in the center. This is Alfred Barr. And on the left is uh, uh, their translator, Peter Lihachev. This was taken in February 1928. Abbott and Barr came to Moscow after visiting Bauhaus, which influenced Barr ideas about the future Museum of Modern Art. While in Moscow, 
while in Moscow, uh, this 26 years old American managed to meet, among others, Rochenko and Lisitsky, and of course me. I remember taking this young fellow to the Russian Museum. For some reason, he was calling me Ivan, but I remember being, him being impressed with the museum collection from Bubnovi Valet group and the Cubism to suprematism and constructivism. And according to Philip Johnson, this is a quotation, Barr's trip to Russia was a significant part of his modern education and the key to his program for the Museum of Modern Art. And this is an important sentence. According to Philip Johnson, the constructivists were in, on his mind all the time. Malevich was to him and later to me the greatest artist of the period. That was in the USA. And he, 1920, uh, 1935, he takes these five paintings from Dorner. Those are the paintings that stayed from I left Malevich left when we, we went back to Leningrad. Including white on white. And since at the time in Germany it was not certain that these kinds of works could be to leave the country, Barr decided to cut off the canvas from the stretcher and smuggle the painting out of Germany rolled in the umbrella. This is how the white on white came to New York. On this later photo of the moment installation in 1950s, we see Barr with these Malevich paintings he brought from Germany to New York. However, at that time, this was not the only event in the US related to the art in the Soviet Union. A year earlier in Philadelphia was published a study, a study uh, entitled The Face of Soviet Art, the author was Christian Brinton, the same person that was involved in 1929 New York exhibition. The publication appeared under the auspices of the American Russian Institute. On, on one occasion of the, uh, it, it was on the occasion of the visit of the Soviet ambassador, uh, His Excellency Alexander Antonovich Trajanovsky. In the text, uh, Brenton covers the previous decades of art in Russia and USSR, making the distinction between Petrograd scene, which he sees as more traditionalist, and Moscow, which is more open to new tendencies related to Frenchmen, Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso, that were articulated in expressionism, constructivism, and suprematism. But the paragraph ends with the conclusion that even Moscow, these moments, uh, uh, that in Moscow, these moments were already passed, that the change toward the realism that is emerging as the face of Soviet art. So even to this American fellow, it was already clear that the uh, scene in the Soviet Union have changed. And the same year, a very informative book published by a translation of the same Osip Baskin, titled The Place of Art in the Soviet Union. We won't go into it because it's very formalistic. Uh, this all fo was preceded the exhibition Soviet Art that took place in Philadelphia uh, Museum, Art Museum. Uh, and the exhibition was uh, um, had another title, The Art of the Soviet Russia. Uh, it was organized by the American uh, Russian Institute at the Pennsylvania Museum of Art. A short foreword was written by Frisky Kimball and the main text by Christian Brit Brinton titled Very Indicatively Realism in Soviet Art. In the text, he's mentioning again the important events, developments, movements from the not distant past, Cuba Futurist Constructive Suprematist, but the main point of his text was this short sentence. By 1924, modernism as such was dead issue in the USSR.
that's the sentence is here. However, considering the rest of the text and the tone co context, this was not this was entirely an affirmative statement in support of realism in Soviet art written by an American and printed in USA. However, this was not the only position about Soviet art that appeared at the time in the USA. In New York, not far from Philadelphia, another American expressed a completely different view on modern art and Russian Soviet art, on modernism and on Russian Soviet art. In 1936, in the Museum of Modern Art, Alfred Barr organized perhaps the most important exhibition of the 20th century titled Cubism and Abstract Art. This was the exhibition that completely changed the nature of the art history narrative. Abandoning entirely the concept of national schools, Alfred Barr introduces international movements as the key notion for telling the story of modern art. As we can see on this diagram, the story presented as an evolutionary tree with movements emerging one from another along the chronological line, we have already seen some uh, uh, line. We have already seen some books being titled by the names of the movements, like Malevich publications. But this was for the first time that the general modern art history was written this way and then materialized through the exhibition. I will not elaborate more about this importance of this, of the importance of this exhibition now, just to point out two movements in the di on the diagram in pre in interesting for us tonight, which are, as you can see, suprematism and constructivism. Influenced by Bauhaus, uh, the exhibition included not only painting and sculpture, but construction, photography, architecture, industrial art, theater, films, posters, and typography. It's very telling to read the, the introduction by Alfred Barr. After some general text, then we have to a concrete uh, individuals. Uh, the first name he's mentioning is Malevich here. And the second name he's mentioning is also Malevich. And then comes Mondrian, Gabo, and again Malevich, Mondrian, Gabo. So that was his uh, I'd say criteria. This was these are for these were the most important artists, abstract artists, and Malevich is obviously his favorite. At the end of the introduction of this catalog, its introduction, only two works were reproduced. They are by Kandinsky and Malevich as examples of non-geometrical and geometrical abstract art. Also interesting uh, detail about this exhibition. We are all familiar with this painting, uh, uh, de d'Avignon. It is here when we have a closer uh, uh, scan. We see it says it's not on in the exhibition. While on this installation view, we see this painting being exhibited, but not as a painting, but obviously as a reproduction. Which means that Alfred Barr was so determined that this painting should be at the beginning of the story that he didn't care if it can get the original or not. He was going to exhibit it, and he couldn't get the original, so he exhibited a copy. And the beginning of the story of the 20th century modern art begins with the reproduction. Also, we can see some, you know, like a famous uh, new descending the staircase next to the staircase being exhibited. Is it accident or not? We don't know. And we see the wall with Malevich paintings that he took from Hanover. 
and also reproduced in the catalog, including Rochenko that was hanging in the Fedorov Davidov's installation a couple of years earlier as Bush, the dead, the dead end of bourgeois art. And the white on white here appears for the first time exhibited in the United States in the Museum of Modern Art. Also in the catalog we can see Tatlin's Monument of the Third International, Rochenko's uh, constructions and Popov and Stepanova stage designs. In catalog is also reproduced the abstract cabinet. An abstract cabinet was at that moment being dismantled in Germany. So this was the only memory of the cabinet and it was placed in the history here. The works were, as you can see, exhibited here the, at, at the exhibition called the Antarctic Kunst. Just for your information, the prices that were given here are the prices how much the director of the museums were paying with this rubbish, for this rubbish. That was the embarrassed the directors of the museums. So Lisitsky was paid $200 and Mondrian was paid 420 Reichmarks. Also, these exhibition now these uh, works that were taken out of the museums were start beginning to exhibit in the ex series of exhibition titled Antarctica Kunst. With this happened to be one poster from the Munich 1936 exhibition, and it is indicative here that the design itself is almost like Lisitsky constructive design, a uh, uh, red wedge. And uh, also the, uh, the, the statement here that uh, is, is, this is a cultural document about on Bolshevism and Jew, Jewishness or Jewish. But this is the most famous cover of the catalog and Tate de Kunst. We should notice also, and this is not strange, the, uh, here the Kunst is under quotation marks. There is a problem how to call this exhibition in a proper way. There are titles Antarctica Kunst with no quotation marks. Then there is Antarctica, but then Kunst is a quotation marks. And there is here, as you can see in the entrance, the entire title is Antarctica Kunst under quotation mark. Which one is right, we don't know. I mean, no one is possible to determine. Now, the key person who was selecting works for this exhibition was uh, Hitler, and he, we see him examining the works in the depot that were taken from the museums. Hitler was also personally involved in selecting works for another exhibition called the Grosse Deutsche Kunstausstellung 1937 that was supposed to show the real art, unlike this art that was called the Generate. This exhibition took place in the building called the Haus für Deutsche Kunst that was designed under Hitler's instructions. And we see here Hitler with a Gerdi Trost, a, a wife of deceased architect, Paul Ludwig Trost, and the director of the museum. And um, he seems doesn't look very happy on this picture. In this atmosphere, Alexander Dorner who do, couldn't, couldn't stay anymore as a director of the London's Museum. Not only 270 works from his music collection were removed from the museum and exhibited in the Arte Kunst exhibition, but he was best known for the abstract cabinet, a result of his collaboration with Elisitsky, who happened to be both Jewish and Bolshevik. However, before leaving the museum, he managed to return all Malevich works back to Hugo Herring, who took the risk, huge risk, and bravely brought the works from the 1927 Berlin exhibition back to Berlin. So, where he had hide them since Berlin of 1937 was not the Berlin of 1927. A couple of years later, 1939, in New York, on this, on this 10th anniversary, the Museum of Modern Art finally got its own building. 
to mark this event, museum or organized an exhibition art in our time where members of the board could now proudly present to the public Demoiselles d'Avignon, that is now this time the original, which was acquired with the Lilia Bliss bequest, and since then it is in the MoMA collection. Immediately after comes the first major museum Picasso retrospective, 40 years of his life, and at that point from the Museum of Modern Art Prospective. Paris was the center of modern art and Picasso its most important artist. Ironically, by that time in Europe, modern art, especially its avant-garde, abstract art, Dada was already removed from the public eyes after, being, after the developments in the USSR and Germany throughout the 19s, while Paris, perhaps surprisingly for, surprisingly for many of you, was never very friendly toward these most advanced movements of modern art. In that sense, the destiny of Pete Mondrian is very illustrative. In other words, at that time, the only modern art based, modern art based on Europe, uh, on European avant-garde movements could be seen, preserved and reinterpreted by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. MoMA was a that, in a way, a Noah's Ark for the European avant-garde. In 1939, the Second World start, uh, begins uh, with the Germany invading Poland, and by 1943, Allies begin bomb, start bombing, bombs start reaching Berlin. This led Hugo Herring to leave Pardon, to Hugo Herring to leave Berlin and moved his, uh, to his native town, Biberach, taking all the Malevich works with him, which, which was, will stay there for the next 14, 15 years. So, in 1942, if somebody was in Berlin, had a chance to see Malevich paintings in some basement, if he knew to whom to ask. Very interesting thing. And then, throughout the war in this uh, small town until 45, still the entire Malevich collection was there. And then came the liberation of Paris, 1944, and Picasso, who stayed in Paris during the occupation, emerged as a hero who, unlike some of his colleagues, didn't collaborate with the occupying authorities. Immediately after the liberation in October, uh, in October 1944, was organized Salon d'Automne, and Picasso was honored with the entire exhibition exhibit. And where Pica Parisians would have a chance to see for the first time his works of the last decade. However, it seems that something, uh, it seems that for the most of the public this was the first time to see Picasso paintings or even encounter modern art. And the reaction was noticed immediately. According to the different accounts, Picasso paintings have been attacked and removed from walls on several occasions so that gendarmes has to be placed in gallery to protect Picasso paintings from Parisians. Now imagine, Paris is a center of modernity. You have a Parisians who are attacking Picasso paintings. So we have scenes with the gendarmes in the gallery. One can imagine confusion in the heads of someone like Alfred Barr, who writes about this incident in his 1946 book on Picasso. The point is, if this was in Paris, how was in the rest of Europe? How to explain to Americans why the greatest modern artists received such treatment in the capital of modern art, Paris, and by Parisians themselves? What happened? What went, went wrong? The answer is simple. Modern art was never really embraced in the capital of modernity. And whatever existed publicly in some circles before the war was erased from public memory during the 30s and especially during the war. And if this was happening in Paris, how was then the rest, the other cities of the post-war Europe? It seems that the Parisians and Europeans had yet to learn what is modern art and the instructions will come from New York. By that time, 
um, for, but for the time being, we'll continue to focus on Malevich's story. The same year, 1944, Sidney Janis, the future important art dealer, published a book, Abstract and Surrealist Art in America, and in introductory section on page 20, we could find Malevich painting titled Suprematist Composition. This painting was one of the paintings Barr brought from Hanover. It was exhibited in 1927 in Berlin and 1936 at MoMA. So this is from the Berlin show and this is from the MoMA show. However, it seems that the exhibition in Kunsthalle Basel, titled Konkrete Kunst, which was organized by Max Biel and Jean, uh, Hans Arp in April 1944, uh, more than a year before the end of the war, and even in which this Malevich painting uh, house under construction was the first painting to be shown in Europe after his death. It was previously exhibited here at, uh, in Berlin. It came to the possession of Ida Binneret from, Dre uh, from Dresden in 1928, although uh, uh, either through Hugo Herring or Alexander Dorner. Then in this 1947 book, The Way Beyond Art, Dorner by Dorner, who is, who is in 1937 managed, to, 1937 managed to immigrate to US with the help of Barr, Panowski, and Gropius, he published the book uh, a way in which Malevich is mentioned only in, on page 106, uh, only in the footnote. In the book, Dorner reproduces these two images of the abstract cabinet for the first time after the Cubism and Abstract Art Catalog and for the first time in Europe after being destroyed. In 1948, this painting by Malevich was exhibited with a Peggy Guggenheim uh, collection in 1948 in, at the Venice Biennale and later in some other uh, European cities. This was one of the earliest traveling exhibition organized by an American that travels the, the, uh, the, after the war to promote European modern art to Europeans. Then uh, we have the Um, in the same year, uh, uh, the exhibition titled uh, Isms in Art sounds almost like a uh, Lisitsky book held in the Museum of Art at the Rhode Island School of Design, which was a radically changed between 1937 and 1941 under the directorship of Alexander Dorner. W one of the isms represented was uh, suprematism, and uh, we have an entire page about suprematism, and uh, in uh, this would be the the painting that was introduced it it was exhibited in paris 1950 michel seufour uh, published his important book the abstract art for which cover was designed by hans arp jean arp uh, in the table of contact, Malevich is included among the main representatives of abstract art. And, and in the book, Sefford published Barr's diagram, interestingly in English, untranslated. In, in a section about Malevich, we can notice a brief biography perhaps published in the, for the first time without mentioning Berlin 1927 exhibition. It reproduces his photo from 1924, from the Lisitsky Arab exhibition, while the reproduction are from the 1927 Bauhaus book, Non-Objective World. In 1952, under the auspices of the, of the, so this is the portrait by Malevich, published. In 1952, under the auspices of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, was organized an exhibition of modern art uh, this today controversial organization was established in Berlin 1950 as a product of the growing Cold War tensions between Soviet bloc and the West that even par uh, par and even partially financed by CIA. While its honorary presidents, including such prominent, prominent intellectuals like Benedetto Croce, John Dewey, Carl Jaspers, or Bertrand Russell. The exhibition was titled 20th Century Masterpieces and first took place in Paris 
at the Musée National d'Art Moderne. Preface was written by John Cassou, the chief curator of the museum, and the foreword by James Johnson Sweeney, the director of the Solomon Guggenheim Museum uh, in New York, who made the selection of the works for the exhibition. And this is how, this is Sweeney, and this is how describes the mission or, in, or intentions of the exhibition. I wanted to assemble a number of modern works known by a reputation throughout the world but not seen in Paris for many years or never at all. Most of the pictures shown here are of the kind that are blacklisted in Russia and that were prohibited or as degenerate in Nazi Germany. We should keep in mind that this is an American uh, a selector or curator who brings to Europe European modern art with no Americans. And most of the works were came from the American collections. As you can see, Kandinsky completely from the American collection. Kirchner as well. Paul Klee, uh, both works. These are some of the illustrations from the catalog, including Kandinsky. And then one Deren comes from the from US, but both the chance comes from US. And Fernand Leger half half. These are private collections, but in New in United States these are museums. And all four Malevich are coming from the Museum of Modern Art. These four suprematist paintings were for the first time shown in Paris and they came from New York. And after Paris, they were shown at a gallery in London. We could understand, yeah, this is, we could understand why someone like Jean Cassou or James Johnson Sweeney would organize this kind of exhibition because they believed in it, they believed in the importance of re-establishing re the modern art narrative in Europe that almost completely disappeared in the previous two decades. But why would CIA support an exhibition that would include Kandinsky, Mondrian, Dishan, and Malevich and send them to, let's, not to Warsaw, let's say, or Prague, but to Paris and London? This is what I could not explain to myself since at that time. For many Americans, public figures, politicians, members of the Congress, even presidents, Modern art was considered to be subversive, even Bolshevik, entirely un-American. This is why in 1952, at the time when exhibition opened in Paris, Alfred Barr had to publish an article in New York Times magazine titled, Is Modern Art Communistic? In which he makes a parallel between some recent statements about modern art by American presidents Truman and Eisenhower with those of Hitler and Stalin. He also writes about the development of Russian Soviet art, seen mentioning here Pevsner and Gabo, Tatlin's monument, and White on White by Malevich. It is most likely that for the majority of the magazine readers, this was the first time they have ever heard about these artists, even about modern art in general. This was in the USA. What was the state of mind at the time in Paris, still considered to be the capital of modern art? In this 19... 54 publication of the Museum of Modern Art, we can, for example, see the usual museum floor plans described in the collection. We can notice some familiar names, groups, and movements. We know them from the history of art. We arrive, but then, these are two floors, but when we arrive on the third floor, it doesn't appear much different until we get to this room, 31. And it says, I guess someone you understand what it says. It says foreign schools, meaning that everything on the three floors is French, except for this room, which is the entire world. So the entire, according to the French view of the art world, Three floors are French, one room is the rest of the world. 
And this is in complete contrast with the Alfred Barr's diagram, which was from the American perspective based entirely on foreign schools. In fact, at that point, the entire MoMA was only room 31. And when we look at the list of the artists under M, you won't find Mondrian on the list. And you won't find Malevich on this list. And you won't find Dishan on this list. And this was the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. It appears that at a time in the mid-50s, on the world art scene, there were three options on the table. One promoted by the Soviet Union called socialistic realism. This is an example. Another in France, we could call the mild modernism or modernism light embodied in the school of Paris without Mondrian, without Malevich or Duchamp. And one in New York, avant-garde modernism or hardcore modernism with Mondrian, Malevich and Dishan as the key characters in the story. While in Paris museum concept of national schools was still alive, MoMA narrative based on international movement was supporting individualism and internationalism on the art scene. It is exactly the concept of individualism and internationalism that was adopted by the organizers of the first documenta. Until this po point, on a couple of occasions, modern European art shown in Europe came from America, Peggy Guggenheim collection and, and 20th century masterpieces. This was the first serious attempt by Europeans themselves to redefine their own modern art tradition. It was an international exhibition and artists are in the catalog enlisted as individuals. But this first documenta included only artists from Western Europe, no Soviet Russian avant-garde and there were no Americans. Exhibition opened 1955 in Kassel, a small German town, and it is exactly this context of Germany and the shadow of the Antarctic Tekuns that was being addressed through this exhibition. It is not only that exhibited world, modern works of art not seen in Germany for many, not only exhibited modern works of art not seen in Germany for many years, but it brought to, the light, to light the faces of all these artists whose work were only a decade earlier, earlier still being dismissed as degenerate. So we see the Klee, Schlemmer, uh, Kokoschka, uh, De Kiriko, Mondrian. Then in 19, uh, this is 1957, two Malevich suprematist paintings were exhibited at this exhibition precursors of the abstract art in Poland at the gallery Denis René and while this painting can be recognized on the Berlin installation we can see it here uh, this painting uh, the second eight red, red rectangles, although brought to Berlin, seems not to be exhibited in Berlin. Nevertheless, it is this painting that appeared in 1957 issue Au Jour de Oui magazine. The occasion was the announcement of the acquisition of the huge number of Malevich works by the Stedelijk Museum. After many years of negotiations, the director, William Sandberg, managed to persuade Hugo Herring to transfer uh, to transfer uh, all the Malevich works from the 1927 Berlin exhibition, except for those that were taken to MoMA, to the Stedelijk Museum. With the first page with the article by, by, by Anton Pevsner begins with this photo of Malevich. This is the third photo ever to be published of Malevich, and it is 1957. It comes from this photo in Polonia, in the Hotel Polonia, from the Malevich exhibition, 1927. There are 
In addition to Pevsner's introductory text and many reproductions of works not seen for decades, there are also recollections by Mikhail Larionov uh, and the emergence of abstract art in Russia by Pavel Mansurov. And at the end, uh, there is a brief article by Sandberg, director of the Stedlik, titled Kazimir Malevich and Pete Mondrian. This was, I would say, a moment when Malevich in a, in a way became Dutch and Stedelijk Museum, one of the best known museums of modern art. Immediately, Stedelijk organized an exhibition of, most import, of, his, of its most important acquisition. At the next year, 19, uh, 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 the 20th century Renaissance that was based on styles and movements including, of course, suprematism. Two uh, was Malevich paintings of the Stedley collection were also exhibiting. After being acquired and exhibited in the Stedley Museum, this collection of Malevich works begins to travel across Europe and many now European cities and people become uh, acquainted with Malevich. It was first shown in Braunschweig in 1958 and Kunstverein in, uh, at the Kunstverein. Then 1923 at Brussels at the P Palace de Beaux-Arts. And interestingly, it says it is organized on the occasion of the 1958 Uni Exposition Universelle, Expo 58, that took place in Brussels that year and received one of the first press coverages. Then the collection was taken to the Whitechapel Gallery in London and begin to, uh, uh, and in the beginning of the catalog, we could find this new photo of Malevich published. This was a cutout from this 1915 group photograph taken inside Malevich's installation. And these are some of the pages of the catalog of the Whitechapel Gallery. Also, this is an interesting case. In this London Times article about this exhibition, it is a bit surprising to see this Malevich self-portrait. It didn't came from Berlin 1927 uh, collection, and thus it was not in the Stedley collection. This last, the last time it was exhibited, it was in Leningrad 1935, and then included in the Russian State Museum collection. However, as far as I know, it was never reproduced before, and this would depend. And also, 19, uh, uh, one of the Malevich works was included in the, in the exhibition of the Guggenheim collection in Paris, and this is the work from the Guggenheim collection in 1959. However, in this 1959 catalog works from the Stedelijk Museum collection, sent to several places in the U.S. We can see the collection was still organized according to the national schools. The catalog has three sections. Dutch included Van Gogh and Mondrian, French, let's say, Picasso and Chagall, and the international, the rest of the world, included Pollock and Malevich. And we see the two Malevich paintings. The same year, 1958, in Brussels, was organized the biggest uh, art fair, a uh, world fair in the entire world, and the entire world was finally getting together after the trauma of the Second World War. Well, one of the symbols of the expo was this giant construction called Atomium as a harbinger of the progress and the brighter future for the entire humanity. By the way, at the time, a, a huge African land called Congo was still a colony ruthlessly governed by the Belgian administration. As part of the expo was organized a big international exhibition titled 50 Years of Modern Art. That at this exhibition we were two paintings by Malevich from the Stedelijk Museums, I suppose representing Holland while on the other hand, Soviet Union, so these are the paintings, they came from Holland, while 
On the other hand, the Soviet Union was represented with a series of well-known socialistic realist works. It is at this exhibition that the post, so these are the works from USSR, but it is at this exhibition that, that the post-war American art today known as abstract expressionism appeared for the first time on international exhibition with historical pretensions, thus bringing European modernism, Russian Soviet avant-garde and abstract expressionism together in one story. So these are some of the Americans, the Koenig. In this book titled Expo 58, published in Czechoslovakia, a member of the Soviet bloc, there is an article about the art exhibition with some inst installation views. Here we, here we could see and recognize familiar paintings by Miro and Arp on the back. Like this would be Miro, and this is Arp, this is Munch. And uh, uh, on the left, we see the installation of the Soviet art. But this was the exhibition that was in one space, all together. In this section of the book about the exhibition, we could see this photo showing visitors admiring these, uh, these realistic, most likely early American painting uh, titled, and the subtitle here is People's Art. While here, another next photo shows uh, people turning back to this painting and it says modern art under quotation, so-called modern art. And this is the uh, Ellsworth Kelly painting in New York. So in that year, 1958, the exhibition called The New American Painting traveled Europe it was curated by Dorothy Miller. We see her in Basel because the exhibition also had lectures. It was the exhibition of abstract expressionists. Uh, and all of the artists from this exhibition were then brought to the, to the Documenta II, 1959. And the MoMA artists, these are some of the views of the Documenta. Some are taken by Hans Hake, by the way, uh, recently was discovered. And of course, Jackson Pollock was the, the big attraction. And here we see, yeah, this is Jackson Pollock. And here we see uh, Arnold Bode, the main force behind the, behind the uh, documenta showing Mondrian. But behind, we see eight red rectangles by Malevich. This Malevich came from the Stedelijk Museum. And we see it here next to Picasso now. Next year, 1959, in Moscow, at Sokolniki Park, took place a, an exhibition organized by, uh, by Americans called, and uh, with, a, with the help of hosts in, in Moscow, uh, an exhibition American, titled American National Exhibition, under the Buckminster Fuller's Dome. And uh, Richard Nixon, came to visit uh, uh, Moscow on this occasion and, uh, and had a famous kitchen debate with his host, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, General Secretary of the Communist Party. However, this was not the only, only Nixon that arrived to Moscow at that time. Alfred, ba uh, ah, this is a, a, a taste of, of the West. It was not Nixon that came to to Moscow at that time, Alfred Barr, the director of the Museum of Modern Art, also came. And to this press release, it, it was supposed he was supposed to give lectures in, on American art uh, uh, and about Museum of Modern Art uh, in uh, in uh, some uh, Soviet uh, places, cities. Although museum. was not uh, involved, uh, let me see, yeah. Although museum was not, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, was not involved in this art exhi exhibition where be besides consumer products and Pepsi Cola, uh, Moscovites had a, a chance to get a taste of, an Ameri of American art as well. So the exhibition of American painting and sculpture took place, 
that included uh, Gorky, uh, Motherwell, uh, the Kooning, Rothko, and of course the, the most attraction received by uh, Jackson Pollock. The exhibition, as you can see, didn't include only abstract artists. It was, the point was to show the diversity of American art. So each artist was represented only with one painting. And uh, although the American National Exhibition was organized by the US government, the art exhibition came almost as a private endeavor organized by its, uh, it is a private contractor in, in a way, organized by Edith Halpert of the Downtown Galleries. As we can see from this thank you note from the US government thanking to those who organized this exhibition. And it was happening at a time when in the Soviet Union there was a still very a strong, there were strong feelings against abstract art, as we can see from this publication, Protiv Abstractionisma, that was printed in 1959. And the, the subtitles were very, you know, illustrative. And we have one Toby, Mark Toby uh, illustration, and this very interesting abstract painter uh, 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 called Morris. Finally, at uh, a, uh, at these international uh, 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 all these international exhibitions that promote individualism and con concept and concept of modern art that was avant-garde oriented are beginning to be materialized through the history books like this one by Herbert Reed titled The Concise History of Modern Painting soon after translated in many languages we could now see Malevich mentioned together with his colleagues Tatlin Rochenko they're being historicized and his work becoming part of the collective memory. This is also from the Stedlik collection. And another, another Malevich here. At this point, many of Malevich works have been reproduced and, uh, and this uh, University of Michigan published an English translation of the Bauhaus edition of the non objective board. At this point, only these images, although we have seen many of the Malevich's works being reproduced, only, Im only images of Malevich. So we are talking about 1959. Only these faces of Malevich were known at this point. And no installation views of Malevich exhibition were ever published still. So the, the, the change in 1962 appeared this book of the, the Knife the Grinder uh, uh, cover, also from the Societe Anonyme collection, titled The Greatest Experiment, Russian Art, 1863-1922. Uh, by Camilla, Camilla Gray. This became one of the most influential and popular books for many years and helped defining what we call today Russian Soviet avant-garde. She went to USSR and also communicated with Alfred Barr and managed to get information and images not published before. In, in the book we could find many of Malevich's works reproduced beginning with these early works and this painting exhibited at bourgeois art in 1930 as bourgeois art, the drawings and sketches for the victory over the sun, over the sun. Uh, the, these, three iconic, uh, the, these three iconic suprematist paintings from the Russian Museum in Leningrad, but also some familiar works like these two from the Museum of Modern Art published together, also 19, uh, 26 years later at the MoMA catalog. And these two iconic paintings also published together, white on white and black on black, also published at the MoMA catalog 1936 together. And the Tatlin 
a monument to the third in the arsenal, also published at uh, Barr's book. But these, uh, in the book we could see many new documentary materials, materials like this one of Tatlin or Lisitsky with Prawn uh, spatial one from 1923 Grosse Berliner Kunstausstellung and constructivist constructivist stage designs Mansurov installation and workers club of Beruchenko but Mansurov and this 1926 photo is the closest we could get to a document on Malevich in this book there is no new photo documents on Malevich no pictures of him no installation use the same year Dumont published this book titled Suprema Suprematism uh, Non-Objective World with a black square on the cover and the eight red rectangles on the back. Inside cover are printed charts with a comprehensive and detailed comparative biography on Malevich. And this book publishes a few new photos of Malevich, apparently taken in 1927 during his war stay in Warsaw, including this from his exhibition at, and reception dinner at, at the Hotel Polonia with the installation view of his works. Book reproduces Malevich's work from the various collections and sources, this one from the Yale University, this two from the Russian Museum in Leningrad, this from the Stedlik Museum, and uh, this one is from Tretiakov Gallery, also Stedlik Museum, private collection, Tretiakov Gallery. So this was more broader scope of the sources. What is interesting, this book publishes for the first time an installation view of Malevich installation in Grosse Berliner Kunsthalle. This is the first time that this photo was published in 1952, in 1962. And exactly 40 years later, it was Berlin, in Berlin, that this exhibition titled The Avant-Garde 1910-1930 took place with the Lisitsky work on the cover. This was perhaps the first comprehensive exhibition of what we call the Russian Soviet Avant-Garde. It was organized in a Kunstverein in Berlin, Academia der Kunst, October, October, November 1967. This is the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution. So, with a revolutionary cover by Lisitsky, and this was not in the East, but in the West Berlin. So, in a way, this exhibition was marking the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution. And the catalog begins with photo of Malevich, and catalog gives comprehensive chronology of Malevich that goes beyond 1935, with list of several paintings exhibited, five from the Stedelijk Museum, so all his faces, but also includes this installation views and. Uh, and was even more interesting to see the catalog is reproducing this 1926 installation view from the Institute of Artistic Culture in Leningrad. Now it comes an interesting exhibition which brings together artifacts from Africa and the avant-garde combination of ethnology and art and it is in the catalog in the catalog it took place in 19 as you said in the catalog it took place in 1969 at the Moderne Museet Stockholm and has two titles, slogans, transform the world and poetry must be made by everyone. The exhibition was conceived by Ronald Hunt and curated together with Pontus Hulten, Hulten and Katja Walden with the assistance of Trolles, Trolles Anderson. The catalog reproduces these, as it says, 1920 Malevich retrospective, and the catalog represents this as it says, yeah, 
54. Yeah, the, yeah, it reproduces this. So this was the exhibition. We can see some of the works. And this reproduces works. I, I am afraid you have to tell them, uh, maybe we should take a vote. A vote. If they want to, uh, to, to continue or not. We, I have 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So we are here. So this is reproduced in this uh, uh, catalog, this exhibition. Also, this uh, uh, five four six shows Malevich as a teacher and also his death. So these are all new photos. But it's interesting to see uh, the list of works, and many are reproduced. But what is most interesting here is the black square is reconstructed. And in this credits, all the people who did reconstructions are mentioned, other reconstructions, but there is no credit for reconstructing the black square. I was wondering if we could see the picture of black square being reconstructed. That would be a nice picture to see. Anyway, reconstruction was not new, uh, not new for someone like Pontus Houten, who already did a reconstruction of Tatlin's third inter uh, monument for the Tatlin's exhibition 19 a year before at the same museum, Moderna Muset. And then also uh, in 1965 uh, at Van, Van Abe Museum, Jan Leering did a reconstruction of uh, uh, Praun uh, by Lisitsky. So reconstructions were not new. And uh, Anderson Trolles, who, Trolles Anderson, who was the uh, uh, participating in the, in the Stockholm Museum, then in 1970 did uh, uh, and this is like, okay, I'm already far away. In 1970, Trolles Trolls Anderson, on the assistance of the Moderna Museum Exhibition, produced this monograph titled Malevich for the Stedelijk Museum. This was uh, the uh, catalog raisonné for the Berlin Kunstausstellung, which was the origin of the entire collection of Malevich in the Stedelijk. Catalog reproduces for the first time many documentary photographs covering entire Malevich's life and work and his death. Many installation views. And this from the 1933 exhibit, 32 exhibition in uh, Leningrad. And on this page, we see this photo of the uh, uh, installation from 1915 Last Futurist exhibition. And in uh, 1971 was organized an exhibition titled, but this is not the photo, or famous photo. Uh, so this is now the new exhibition organized in New York by the New York State Council. It is called the Russian Art of the Revolution. And this photo of Malevich was, uh, for the first time appeared. And these works from American collection were introduced. But it is this exhibition, uh, <coughs> Of the, uh, in this catalog of this exhibition, From Surface to Space, Russia, 1960-1924, organized by the Gallery Murzinska in Köln, that this photo was for the first time reproduced. So this photo, first time appeared, published in 1974 in this catalog, not before. And in this then exhibition in 1977, it was reproduced again, together with the, with the Tatlin's uh, installation from the same exhibition. And then Malevich begins to appear in the Russian publications, like this one in 1973, which we have this same uh, painting now that was also exhibited here. And this is a Metropolitan Museum exhibition in 1977. We see a very impressive list of artists that came to 
to, uh, to New York, that were brought to New York in a cooperation with the Soviet Union, Soviet government, including these two Malevich paintings. And then we have Paris, New York, uh, Paris, Moscow exhibition. These are <coughs> it's Pontus Hutten uh, exhibition. That these are installation views, the Tatlin's uh, uh, tower, and Malevich. These are reproductions from the catalog Malevich and the Red Cavalry. And we see the painting from in Petrus in Leningrad. The same for, uh, work was reproduced in this book uh, published in the uh, Soviet Union, but it has different uh, years. It has 77, 80, 85, so we are not sure if it's in the first edition. And then finally, Malevich comes to Moscow. It's 1980, uh, first comes to Leningrad, 1988, in, the, <clears throat> in organization of the Stedlik Museum, uh, State Russian Museum, and uh, which is this uh, installation uh, at the State Russian Museum and Tretyakov Gallery. We have Malevich retrospective, uh, first time after his death in Moscow and Leningrad. And the black square we see here, also reproduced on this Kunstforum, but in this article we find a strange reproduction of this installation titled Kazimir Malevich, last futurist exhibition, dated 85, 86. Completely different date after Malevich's death. And then there is in the text analysis of this re-emergence of Malevich. And that's uh, something that uh, it's not apparently easy to explain. There is even a letter of Malevich published to the, sent to the newspapers that Mr. attributed his exhibition, and the exhibition went to Ljubljana in 1986. This is a coverage by Marina Gruzinic, uh, the review of the exhibition. And then Art in America publishes a letter from Kazimir Malevich among the letters. Malevich was questioning the uh, uh, trend of uh, being copied by many artists in the United States at the time, appropriationists. And then Malevich was invited to uh, Graz uh, for the exhibition called the Trigon International Exhibition. We see Malevich as a contemporary artist appearing here, and this is a part of his installation. And in the interview, one way to explain this Malevich uh, that Marina Grzenich had with, uh, with Peter Weibel, uh, uh, Malevich was, this Malevich was uh, uh, labeled as, let me find, this is the end uh, of the story. Soon, soon after trying to address this reappearance of Malevich, trying to address these reappearances of Malevich in an interview of Marina Gershinich with Peter Weibel, Malevich seems to be properly described as a demon of the art world who questions the linearity of history. So, then um, Malevich appears also at the Moscow Embassy here with the, uh, within NSK installation, and it is part of the retro avant-garde uh, NSK uh, uh, series of installations here. And also in the exhibition in the new museum, he appeared as uh, selected by Kim Levin, and his work, uh, Three Suprematist Icons, were estimated $2,400 or $3,000, not very expensive, but nevertheless, he got one third of this amount, and you can see the check written to Malevich by the Marsha Tucker, director of the museum of, of, uh, of the director of the new museum. Also, Malevich appears in this exhibition uh, in Vienna Museum, in the Modern Museum in Vienna. This is a contact uh, exhibition in Mumok, Vienna, again. And in this exhibition in Berlin, What is Modern Art? We see the Malevich installation. Also, the exhibition, The Black Square. And this is in Paris. Exhibition, The Second Hand. Also, we see Malevich as a contemporary artist. And on occasion of the of this gentleman Alexander Brenner's action 
in Sedlik Museum when he painted, with, which is a part of the exhibition here. Malevich wrote a letter in which he protests against the uh, treatment of Brenner, and he thinks that Sedlik Museum is in fact Sedlik Bank. And Malevich works are also exhibited in some other occasions, and this is a one letter to Kazimir Malevich by the director of the Magba. Malevich was also being sold at the Sotheby's for a different price. And this was a theme of the exhibit that was appear at the exhibition called Kazimir Malevich Autobiography, which shows, in fact, the story that I told you here. How that, that story is now turned into exhibition. This is Berlin show reconstructed. And the last futurist exhibition, also the painting of the last futurist exhibition, painting of the of the repeated last futurist exhibition and the newspaper print of the last futurist exhibition. And this uh, view of the death of Malevich and this uh, addressing the this uh, art and money story that we could see today here in this museum. This is it. I'm sorry it was really long than longer than I expected. <laughs>